Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Better Data Governance for Responsible AI, sponsored today by Google Cloud. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information required throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Shuba Lal. Shuba is a Senior Program Manager and, and Data Governance Lead for AI Machine Learning at Google Cloud. She is an established leader experienced in driving large-scale ex-functional risk and compliance initiatives, including iData Governance for Cloud Google Cloud AI and Machine Learning, Alphabet-wide programs for regulatory compliance, standards compliance, risk and controls, and internal audit. She has a background in software engineering and a passion for accelerating business through compliance and risk-aware decision-making. And with that, I'll give the floor to Shuba to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you uh, so much, Shannon. Um, so um, um, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about some of the uh, offerings that Google has in the areas of data governance and responsible AI. Uh, our approach um, to responsible AI and uh, data governance, uh, as well as share some of the learnings that we've collected uh, based on our experience uh, with uh, data governance and uh, responsible AI. So uh, without uh, further ado, let's dive right in. I'm going to start uh, with um, just uh, some um, uh, questions that we have been uh, hearing our customers ask us uh, regarding especially uh, AI data use for generative AI, especially uh, in, in the recent times, but also generally uh, just uh, data uh, as it's uh, relevant to AI. Um, some concerns that we have heard from our customers are around the areas of, well, data is uh, my differentiator uh, and, and certainly that's true. And, um, you know, how do we protect, uh, how do I protect my uh, intellectual property uh, when I am using uh, data for customizing foundational models or even for other uh, situations where uh, I am actually using data uh, in the context of AI, even if it's not specifically uh, for generative AI purposes, uh, which is where foundational models uh, tend to play a role. Mm -hmm. uh, they also are very concerned about uh, ensuring uh, that their data is uh, secure and compliant, uh, as, especially as they are using data for uh, training models uh, for AI ML purposes. Really, who has access to my data? Uh, that's uh, an important question uh, that, that we hear as well. And then, of course, we hear questions uh, around you know, cost effectiveness, uh, not necessarily related to data, but generally still a concern uh, that we've uh, seen our customers uh, express to us. Uh, and then, of course, uh, questions around how do I ensure that in the space of AI ML, um, we are actually mitigating harms. Um, and what I wanted to do is start off with these questions because we take a very holistic approach to, um, uh, to data governance uh, at, uh, at Google here. Um, the first thing that I wanna point out is that uh, data governance and responsible AI are both pillars of a larger enterprise readiness offering uh, that we have here at Google. Um, and enterprise readiness actually is a really broad topic that covers uh, through, uh, you know, that, that we've actually uncovered uh, with our conversations through customers like you, uh, it covers many topics. Uh, we've boiled it down uh, to four pillars. Uh, and of course, uh, these pillars include uh, data governance and privacy, uh, security uh, and compliance, uh, which is a big one, uh, reliability and sustainability, and also safety and responsibility. In today's talk, 
I'll be taking us through two of these pillars, the data governance and privacy pillar, and also the uh, uh, safety and responsibility. So um, let's start with our very first uh, topic, which is the um, data governance and um, privacy pillar. But before actually getting into that, I do wanna um, start with just a little bit more about um, enterprise readiness and why it's important. Um, we actually take it very seriously uh, here at Google, and it's really at the core of our approach uh, to um, generative AI and just AI in general. Uh, enterprise readiness, uh, so, so you know, you, you might ask, uh, why, why should I care about enterprise readiness? Why is it important? And I think the key thing to remember here is that at Google, uh, we actually want to ensure that through our efforts in the area of enterprise readiness, we are protecting your data, as in customer data. And we are only ensuring that your data is used in ways that you intend uh, for it to be used, especially uh, in the case of AI ML development, that we ensure uh, the safety uh, of the data that we get from our customers so that it is secure and that it is safe uh, from, um, you know, our, our applications are safe from, from threats. So generally speaking, the area of enterprise readiness is critical to helping our customers build high quality, secure uh, machine learning applications. And with that, uh, let me start to dive into the area of data governance and privacy as it pertains to AI ML. So, Let's start with uh, um, how we enable our customers with their uh, data governance efforts and privacy efforts. The first and most important thing to remember about um, this uh, enabling and offering that we have is that we actually really want to make sure our customers know that their data is their data. Um, so once again, your data is your data. In the context of generative AI, what your data includes are input prompts, model output, training data, all of these. And we believe that these are part of your data and your IP. So we take lots of measures to ensure that we do not use our customer's data to train our own models, that we process customer data in ways that are in accordance with their instructions. And we actually go a step beyond. Uh, we were the first in the industry to publish uh, the AI ML privacy commitment, which outlines our belief that our customers, meaning you, should have the highest level of security and control of your data and how it's used for AI ML. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about data governance, uh, uh, if, if I didn't talk about privacy and security in the context of data governance. So um, I briefly touch on the fact that uh, we have instituted uh, lots and lots of best practices around privacy to ensure that we are in compliance with regulations like the GDPR, and also that we have extensive controls to protect uh, our customer data from other customers, users, attackers, and any kind of unauthorized access by Google employees when their data is being used for AI ML development. So let's take a closer look at how data, your data especially, is used for uh, generative AI. So the first question that I get from customers is, what happens to the prompts that I send? Uh, these are prompts that are uh, inputs, they are provided to the generative AI, and a response is generated. So typically that's really how 
the prompts are used, both the input and the output are always encrypted in transit. Then next often I hear from customers the question about um, how do I customize my models when I'm using AI? And how does my data then get used in the process of customization of the models? So the answer there is yes, uh, our customers are enabled to customize their uh, generative AI applications through model tuning. And uh, what you can do is uh, that when you do model tuning to train, uh, you actually train an adapter model. Uh, an adapter model is a model that works alongside the foundation model. It is trained on the customer's data, but importantly, it is only accessible to the specific customer who actually trained that adapter model. So adapter models are fully controlled by the customer, including who can access them and when to delete them. Not only do you control your data, used for adapter model training, but your input data is secured at every step of the way as well. And it's also important to note that we do not use uh, customer data logs or any of those uh, additional information to train our foundation models by default. Moving on, I'm gonna, also quickly touch upon um, effective data governance and our approach um, to, um, to data governance. So um, effective data governance and privacy requires a multifaceted approach that starts with a clear set of principles and privacy first design tools and processes to ensure adherence to those principles. And what we've done is uh, we've developed policies internally uh, regarding the use of data for AI ML development. These policies address both the use as well as the handling of, uh, of data uh, for AI ML, but they also uh, ensure that data classifications are available and guidance is provided to our teams about how to classify their data, what kinds of um, information about data is important to retain so that uh, they can that information about the data then can be used to uh, conduct uh, our reviews uh, for data governance purposes. And that uh, you know we have the appropriate set of um, controls to enable protection of data, any data, including customer data uh, during model development and inference. Uh, effective data governance also requires prioritizing data privacy and security. So uh, we do build uh, the strongest security technologies into our AI products so that we can ensure protection of this data and appropriate controls uh, as, uh, as data is used for AI ML purposes. Our approach also leverages Google Cloud's uh, privacy experience and incorporates uh, privacy by design principles um, such that designing AI products and services happens with privacy safeguards right from the very beginning. Uh, we offer tooling and solutions like the cloud DLP or data loss prevention tool, uh, which ensures that uh, we can um, redact uh, data uh, as it's used for AI ML or any purpose for that matter. We also offer content filters and recitation checks that basically enable us to improve our data governance and privacy efforts, as well as we offer these tools to our customers so they too can leverage these same tools to improve their data governance and, and privacy efforts. We also provide transparency for customer data usage and assist enterprises in their data protection impact assessment efforts with our DPIA resource center and documentation. 
And uh, we have achieved many privacy and security certifications, such as ISO 27001 and compliance attestations from various different independent auditors who've, ex who've assessed our practices, giving you the confidence that you need around our data governance approach and our practices. So when setting up your own data governance program, I wanna leave you with three actions that you can take right now as leaders. Number one, record and manage your data provenance. Now this is really important. It's, it's important because it sets the foundation for data governance for AI ML. As you know, models are heavily dependent on their data uh, for their performance. So it's very important therefore to know what data sets have gone into training which version of the models. So keeping model lineage and versioning straight as well as specific versioning around the data sets that actually have gone into training those particular checkpoints is absolutely key. It is the foundation on top of which then your data governance for AI ML programs can be built. My understanding would be that even without AI ML, you already have some of the data mapping, data flows already uh, understood for your, for your organization. But for AI ML purposes, we also wanna start tracking data provenance as, uh, as uh, data is used to uh, develop models. The next thing that I would uh, focus on is to establish policies for data use, classification, and handling. So this is key as well. Um, what kinds of, how, how would you classify different kinds of data that your organization uses? Is it uh, user data? Is it customer data? Or is it some other kind of data? And um, when you classify these uh, data sets into various different classifications, what are uh, the approved use cases to use those data sets? Uh, who is going to have access to those data sets when they're used for AI ML? And um, providing guidance to your engineering teams and product teams um, is, is key uh, and establishing policies uh, allow you to actually publish uh, your uh, your um, uh, stance on, on how this data should be used or could be used, as well as how it should be handled. Now, one idea is to actually publish policies and the next is to actually uphold these policies through actual AI governance procedures. So setting up some kind of procedures, uh, reviews, uh, processes to enable that these, uh, the, uh, to enable the use of this data in ways uh, that upholds the policy is also uh, equally important. And then lastly, what I would focus on is taking a very risk-based approach uh, to managing data, uh, especially its use for AI ML. Now, as you know, uh, in AI ML, there is large amounts of data sets that uh, can be used uh, to, to train models. And um, it's really important when you are using these data sets to A, comply with the policy, but also be aware that especially when there is a huge amount of scale uh, and, and there is a lot uh, of different use cases to be able to have some way of prioritizing uh, those that are kind of going to be the most highest risk or potentially the highest risk and also mitigating those risks and then aligning with leadership's risk tolerance levels on, uh, on uh, taking a, um, um, a going forward with a use case or not. So having a risk-based approach actually ensures that uh, when using data and handling data, that it's actually done in alignment with leadership's uh, risk appetite as well. Moving on um, to the fourth pillar, 
uh, for of enterprise res readiness, which is safety and responsibility. I'll start with um, a little bit of history here. Five years ago, we were the first uh, companies, one of the first companies to publish AI principles. Uh, these principles were crafted with input from customers and partners, and they're at the core of how we design and operate our generative AI products. We work with our customers to collectively achieve the intended benefits and avoid unintended potential harms of these uh, amazing technologies. We operationalize these principles in three ways. Processes to review products and use cases. Tooling that's available both to our internal teams as well as to our customers and partners. And third, through industry leading research and best practices. So let's take a look at an example of our review process. When we conduct a responsible AI review, we follow three steps. First, we identify potential harms. Then we assess the risk levels. And last, we develop mitigation plans. One of our customers wanted to use image analysis to help categorize images in a way that would help to flag content that might be offensive to users enable better editorial decisions, and to enable better ads targeting. We helped the customer identify potential harms, both in their business rules and in potential bias uh, in the image classifiers. We assessed the risk levels that led to a prioritized list of mitigations to establish fairness testing for sensitive categories and subgroups. And ultimately, all of this resulted in a better experience for their users and a higher confidence in the implementation. So conducting these uh, responsible AI assessments is a skill that can be acquired in many ways. It's different than standard decision making, making. and we welcome the opportunity to engage with you to conduct one or more responsible AI assessments to help you launch better products and to impart some of our experience onto your organizations. Tooling is also a key area of leadership for us. We were one of the first to deploy the automated adversarial testing and are consistently leading the industry on content filters and checkers. So let's take a closer look at some of these tools, starting with safety filters. So here's an example output from our safety filters. We classify across 15 potentially harmful categories and provide a confidence score of zero to one so that you can set safety filters that are appropriate for your use case. The next one is recitation checkers, which are another important tool. They help to ensure that the outputs from your generative AI applications do not replicate existing content. Our state-of-the-art recitation checkers work across text, images, and video, and run with a low latency that's needed uh, for modern applications. At Google Cloud, we continue to invest in best-in-class processes and tooling for responsible AI. We tap into the best thinking and innovation from our Google research teams and also work with third parties from academia, government, and industry to ensure that we are bringing to you the best, most comprehensive solutions to ensuring your applications minimize potential unintended harms and maximize the intended benefits for your users. I wanna leave you with 
three actions you can take right now as leaders that are in the responsible AI um, area. The first one is to be an active and visible sponsor for responsible AI. Responsible AI actually um, it is important uh, from the standpoint of um, generally ensuring that the applications that we are uh, we are creating are, are going to be useful and, and truly uh, achieve the intended benefit. Um, there have been a lot of concerns and questions uh, around data quality as it's used for uh, for different kinds of AI applications. And one of the key things to really pay attention to is ensuring that our data is actually fully representative, uh, it's free of bias, and that it is actually being prepared very carefully uh, as it is being used uh, to develop models. So um, there needs to be a understanding uh, as, as we are using data to develop models that, uh, that needs to be shared and consistently understood uh, across the organization in order to ensure that uh, this data is used responsibly as we develop AI ML uh, and we um, create applications uh, using, using this data. The second is to establish AI governance processes um, if you've not already done so. Here, um, I, what I'd like to point out is um, that um, at Google, uh, what we do is uh, we have um, processes through which we conduct uh, these reviews, uh, like the one that we were uh, talking about earlier in this uh, talk, uh, that enable us to actually ensure that the applications that we are developing are actually living up to the principles that we have set, uh, set forth uh, for the development of AI in a responsible way. So um, oftentimes it is helpful not only to publish these uh, principles or internal policies that we have around data governance, but also to have teams who can actually conduct reviews and provide guidance on specific use case by use case uh, basis to ensure that uh, these principles and these kinds of policies are actually being implemented and upheld as uh, AI is being developed. And then lastly, uh, we uh, also want to uh, build responsible AI capacity and capabilities uh, across teams uh, and throughout the organization. Um, it is really important um, to actually have teams that work cross-functionally to, uh, to make these uh, principles and um, policies actually a reality. So um, not only is it an effort of say the compliance teams, but it actually needs to be a very uh, joint effort, uh, a collaborative effort between your privacy teams, your security teams, legal uh, teams, of course, uh, product teams who are uh, consisting of uh, both uh, product management, engineering, and of course, the, the data practitioners like yourselves to come together and uh, as a collaborative effort, uh, ensure that when designing these kinds of applications that we are actually considering um, all aspects of uh, both use and handling of data and also the resultant products that uh, are, are going to be created in terms of models and how they'll function as a kind of collective picture uh, before we actually make decisions on how we move forward. So uh, it's, it's extremely important to actually bring together 
uh, just a, a, a set of cross-functional folks uh, who can collectively uh, provide input and, and uh, help make uh, decisions that can uh, drive towards better, more responsible uh, products and also uh, handling and use of data in, in responsible ways. Um, in closing, I'd like to ensure that um, um, you are aware that enterprise readiness is a topic that we take very seriously at Google, uh, especially at Google Cloud, and that our generative AI products have been built uh, with um, all of these four foundational pillars in mind uh, to give you the confidence that your data is only being used in ways that you intend, your applications are safe from threats and always available to deliver the value that your users are expecting from you. Thank you. And I'm happy to open it up to questions. Shiva, thank you for this presentation. If you have questions for Shiva, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. So, uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. So, Shiva, can you elaborate on enterprise readiness? What does it refer to exactly from a technology perspective and security? Yeah. So uh, enterprise readiness is really a concept uh, that is a collection of uh, various different uh, areas that need to come together in order to ensure that um, our customers are able to uh, rely on the offerings that we have here at Google to develop applications that are high quality uh, and uh, are, are secure. Um, so what that means is that um, there are offerings that are already available uh, through the Google Cloud infrastructure, uh, including the security offerings that we have, uh, the um, um, data governance work that we already do and assurances that we provide to our customers, uh, the responsible AI uh, work that we do uh, to ensure that our customers actually can leverage all of these existing capabilities when they are building their applications without actually having to reinvent the wheel or create these themselves. So there is already a... A uh, rich offering of these kinds of services that are already provided that enable our customers then to go off and um, focus on what is really important, which is how to use their data to train their models for their specific use case without actually having to um, worry too much about the underlying infrastructure that is already in place and offerings that are already in place to enable you to develop these applications uh, responsibly. These are the same applications or uh, offerings that will also enable you to actually get a jumpstart on your own data governance initiatives, on your own privacy initiatives, and your own responsible AI initiatives as well, because there is tooling that is being offered, uh, whether it's in the form of DLP or in the form of various different um, recitation checkers, et cetera, that not only are being leveraged by us uh, in order to develop our own models, but are also being offered to our customers so that they too can take advantage of these tools and, um, um, and use them as part of their uh, data governance uh, and responsible AI efforts. Perfect. And what are the steps to become a data governance? So the steps we um, talked about um, um, are um, you must start with having a really good understanding of what your data sets are, what the flows are, where they exist, 
and, and such. Now, this is not new to AI ML. Uh, this is actually a um, standard practice um, for uh, that's required anyways for your own uh, privacy compliance and such. But for AI ML, I think the unique and interesting twist that AI ML presents uh, is that in addition to your data mapping, what you want to do is also ensure that you have a very good understanding of how data is being used and what versions of data sets are being used for developing which model. So tracking your model lineage, tracking your data uh, provenance is the, I would say the first step to really understand which data sets and which versions of data sets are being used to train which checkpoint. So that's the unique and new thing with AI ML that uh, you might have to do in addition to your already existing data governance uh, efforts uh, that, that, um, uh, that, that include data mapping. On top of that, as a company, uh, you really, or as an organization, you really need to decide uh, what policies uh, and guidance you want to put in place uh, with regards to the use and handling of data. Some of this may already be in place for uh, generally data governance efforts, but for AI ML specifically, um, there might be some unique nuances and twists uh, that come about as a result of using data to train models that need to be comprehended as part of your policies uh, and frameworks that you put in place specifically for uh, AI ML uh, uses and, and handling of data. So that's the next step. And of course, in order to uphold these uh, policies and procedures, um, uh, uh, policies, you would need to then put in place some procedures and processes uh, that would ensure that, uh, that appropriate um, practices are put in place to um, enable uh, the um, compliance uh, with, these, uh, with these policies. Uh, and um, uh, once you've actually gotten that um, going, then you would want to start to think about um, really monitoring data use and data handling and really starting to um, think about how this is not compliant uh, with existing policies, how it is that policies actually need to maybe expand in scope or uh, address some of the new use cases that are coming your way uh, as, as you're noticing, and then continually evolve uh, through an iterative approach, the policies that you've put in place, as well as uh, continue to evolve your um, data provenance efforts as well. As many of us know, this is a fairly nascent space. Uh, lots and lots of new things are happening in the space of AI ML. So it's, um, it's, it's quite natural to expect that, um, that your policies will evolve, especially with changing business needs and especially with uh, just the way the space is evolving uh, as well. And uh, also, uh, your um, uh, your your procedures uh, will, will need to evolve um, uh, accordingly as well. So I would continually um, iterate on the approach, but I would start with these steps and then uh, and and then go ahead and uh, continue to iterate. Perfect. Thank you. So and Shiba, uh, how do data governance, AI governance, IT governance? And, and corporate governance intersect and or complement. Yeah, so um, there is a, um, a set of organizations uh, in, in any company who um, will be uh, going forth with, um, uh, with data governance related efforts. My um, experience has been that when you set policy, it is actually very important to ensure that any policy that is being created uh, or uh, published 
is actually done, done is is getting approvals uh, and alignment uh, from any relevant stakeholders. And, and usually this needs to be a very broad uh, set of stakeholders that come from various different areas um, and um, uh, different functions uh, within the company so that any policy that is being created is actually aligned with existing policies, whether it's in the area of security or privacy or um, say, um, uh, another organization, um, so that all your policies together um, form a, a web uh, that actually provide uh, guidance collectively uh, to an end users. You definitely want to avoid any conflict in policies. There shouldn't be that. And also that uh, policies ensure that policies are actually complementing each other. So if there is a policy that addresses a privacy, uh, then the security policy should jive well with it and they should actually point to each other. Uh, same thing with your data governance policy as well. And typically what happens is that in large organizations, you might have an overarching policy that is say a company-wide policy but then that policy actually makes room for uh, smaller divisions in the company to come up with their own policies that are unique to those uh, particular divisions and, and speak more to the specific needs, the specific product needs or the specific function for that particular division. But always those policies need to be in alignment with the larger overarching policy as well. So. Um, I think the key message is that um, not only do you want to have your teams uh, who are your compliance teams collaborating with each other uh, and uh, collectively uh, leveraging each other's work as they conduct their specific reviews, but their policies should all be in alignment with each other as well. And that truly is the kind of building block, the first step that um, as, as you're setting your policies that you want to address uh, in order to ensure uh, that um, uh, your efforts uh, uh, in the data governance space, in the larger data governance space are all aligned with each other. Okay, and so many great questions coming in. Feel free to put them in the Q&A portion. Uh, and so Shuba, I agree that uh, a key objective is to ensure that data utilized in an AI model is free of bias. What methodology or best practices do you recommend to achieve this goal? Yeah, so ensuring that data is free of bias is uh, something that our responsible AI team actually uh, looks into. Uh, it is um, actually done with a really good understanding of the data and also uh, with some tooling and testing that is uh, done to ensure that we are uh, really uh, looking at the data and making it uh, as representative as possible. Um, it is covered as part of um, our reviews of data uh, as data sets are used to train models. And uh, a lot of this work is actually based on research that uh, has been done uh, that has enabled us to uh, really develop the tooling and the processes that are necessary to eliminate bias uh, from our data sets and uh, from, from the models that are uh, resultant from those data sets. Thank you. And what are the Oops. What are the differences between machine learning governance practices versus generative AI governance practices? Yeah. So machine learning practices in the past, uh, we have dealt a lot with classification type of models, models that have been uh, able to uh, predict, uh, for instance, um, certain, uh, you know, predictive models uh, for, for certain use cases and such. And um, those have been um, areas that uh, we've actually um, looked at uh, various different risks as well. 
But with generative AI, the big difference that I see is that generative AI tends to actually be very heavy in the use of data uh, to train models. So we are talking about large data sets uh, that are used to, to train these models that then can actually uh, generate results. So uh, the risk that, uh, that these models present is, is actually uh, quite high from two aspects. Number one, uh, that the output of the models, uh, these generative models, um, can be um, quite um, uh, imaginative out of the regular parameters that you might set for a classification model. So an example would be if you have a model that is uh, specifically going to classify uh, certain um, text as, uh, say, uh, a certain category and, and provide you um, a, a category, that output is actually pretty limited in its range to the categories that um, the generative model, uh, the classification model is, is going to be able to output. Compare that to a generative model, which can actually have a much wider range of outputs from which it can select because it's generative and that you may not be able to even predict in advance. So in terms of the outputs that these generative models can, um, can, uh, can provide, uh, there is a, a huge range uh, and uh, that huge range uh, then gives a lot of freedom to the model uh, to, um, to, to uh, um, uh, provide you an output that, that uh, can, can come from anywhere in this, um, in, this, uh, in this large range. And what that typically means is that, um, that you have to then take additional measures to ensure that uh, these outputs are, um, uh, are um, free of um, any kind of recitation that the models were trained on and other kinds of controls that you need to put in place so that these um, outputs are, are uh, not going to essentially uh, create any unintended um, uh, consequences than, than what the uh, model was intended for. So that's one. On the input side, uh, these models are actually taking huge amounts of data uh, to train uh, these uh, models, even the foundational models. So one has to be really careful to look at these data sets and understand all the risks that come with these data sets and ensure that um, these risks are actually mitigated uh, as we are training these models. So both on the input as well as on the output, uh, there is a larger risk on the generative AI models than there is on uh, regular machine learning uh, type of models. And one has to account for those both legal as well as business risks uh, when, um, uh, when thinking about uh, generative AI models. Okay, so much great information here. Lots of questions coming in. We've got about 10 minutes left to get through the as many questions as we can. So Shiva, um, let's say I've deployed a LLM foundation model, which obvious, uh, which obviously pre-trained. What technique would you recommend to manage model bias and model drifting? So I am um, not an expert in uh, the um, specifics of um, uh, model drifting and um, model bias, because this is something that our responsible AI uh, team handles. Uh, but I do know that uh, both of these are areas uh, that uh, we look at uh, at Google uh, for our own models. And um, these involve usually uh, reviews of, uh, of these models and uh, appropriate um, monitoring of these models to ensure uh, that we are actually en uh, enabling these models to be um, both unbiased as well as uh, free from drift. And 
Shiva, how do you handle the people culture element of data governance? What are the learnings of this to best implement AI? So I think the, the key here is that um, the, um, the, the culture of our teams uh, needs to be um, just as um, inclusive and, um, and as um, aware of, of, uh, um, of the kind of issues that we've had uh, with uh, models and AI in the past um, uh, uh, to ensure that we are able to um, model uh, the uh, the kind of diversity and representativeness that we are looking for in our uh, development teams uh, as much as possible uh, as well. So I think uh, our, our teams uh, here uh, from a responsible AI perspective are actually very, in, uh, very um, carefully uh, looking at uh, various different uh, happenings uh, in the world. Uh, they're aware of what's happening outside of Google as well. And uh, looking to incorporate uh, all the learnings that we have uh, regarding uh, the issues that come up with uh, all kinds of uh, um, fairness and bias issues, as well as just kind of social harm types of issues to ensure that when we are developing our models, uh, that we are actually comprehending these and taking measures to avoid them in the functionality uh, of our models as we are developing them. And not only that, but also uh, helping our customers develop models in ways uh, that they can work uh, through as they were intended. So um, it, it's, it's always an effort of ensuring that our ethicists are uh, involved in um, the development of our models, ensuring that uh, their input is heard and it's actually implemented, uh, and that ultimately our models are um, free of, uh, of these kinds of biases or any kinds of issues, and also in alignment with our own leadership's interest in ensuring that these models behave uh, the way they are supposed to behave. Neat. And what are the steps to become a data governor from a technical point of view? So programming language, any specialization on a data cloud storage? So I would say that um, it is a field that is uh, quite, um, uh, quite diverse in, uh, I've, in the kinds of people who I've seen become data governance uh, practitioners. Uh, I have found that some kind of technical uh, background is actually quite helpful. Uh, so in my case, for instance, uh, having written some software myself in the past has been helpful uh, in it, being able to understand how uh, the life cycle works and how data is used in the development of, of these uh, models and such. So um, I think uh, that is helpful. Uh, and then I would say a good amount of risk and compliance uh, background uh, is also very useful. So between having some kind of technical knowledge of the field itself, as well as uh, risk and controls background, I found that most of the folks I work with have uh, some, uh, some uh, combination of, of those two uh, types of skills. Uh, from a data governance uh, uh, standpoint. Now, um, in the responsible AI realm, I have seen many more um, folks who have uh, backgrounds in ethics and such. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I would say that uh, the um, ability to, to manage risk uh, and compliance is, uh, is somewhat uh, evident in, in the work that we do 
and a good skill to have as you think about a career in data governance. Great. I love it. So Shiba, what are the three most important things employees should know before using and relying on enterprise AI? Well, I'd say that some of the key things um, that anybody should um, be aware of as uh, they are looking to use um, uh, their uh, data sets to, to train models is number one, have a really, really good understanding of the data itself uh, and make sure that um, you understand um, how the data is, is structured, how representative it is, you've done some kind of data visualization and such to ensure that you yourself have a fairly good understanding of, of the data. Secondly, I would say that as you're using um, Google's uh, enterprise uh, readiness um, offerings to uh, train your models, uh, make sure that you are actually uh, aware of uh, the different kinds of offerings that are already there and you're using them appropriately. So um, look, you know, having access to a data loss prevention tool so that you can actually uh, redact the data sets of PII uh, as you start to uh, use them for, for model training and what have you. Uh, having access to these tools and being able to use them so that you can appropriately uh, design both what your input as well as what your outputs would look like with the help of these tools uh, is, is also, I would say, uh, paramount. And then lastly, um, I would say that um, as you are training models and uh, you are uh, developing these models, really understand um, the um, needs that you have for the organization. Uh, what is the specific use case? And um, what does it really warrant? Does it warrant um, a um, custom model? Does it warrant just regular model tuning? Does it warrant just uh, needing a foundation model that you can feed your prompts to? Really understanding uh, what the architecture should be, um, what uh, types of models uh, you really need to create or use out of the box, and, um, and then how to deploy uh, them, uh, making use of all the offerings that are already there. Uh, to help you ensure that uh, you're developing models uh, that A, are using data in a manner that uh, is, is comfortable to you uh, and is in line with your policies, and two, also is functioning the way you intend it to function. Perfect. And I'm going to ask for just the elevator pitch here. We've got just two minutes left, but I'm going to slip one more question in. Since gener generative AI or any other AI subsets could generate stunning outcomes, you might cover about auditing is the most important to make sure enterprises do not take the outcome as is. You cut up there for a moment, Shannon. Do you mind repeating the question? Sure. Yeah, since generative AI or any other AI subsets could generate stunning outcomes, I expect you might cover about auditing is the most important to make sure enterprises do not take the outcome as is. Yeah, so I think uh, what we're talking about here is different kinds of checks that we have uh, to ensure that your outputs are... Uh, are being then filtered. So we talked about some safety filters that will enable your outputs and depending on the thresholds that you set can enable your outputs to be uh, free of uh, certain kinds of um, um, uh, parameter, you know, certain kinds of parameters that you actually will set. So certain kinds of um, um, things that, that, that you don't want to be um, output uh, can actually be set uh, with, with those kind of recitation uh, filters and such. Um, 
uh, and and the um, other thing that you're talking about with respect to um, auditing, uh, typically what happens is that uh, there are standards uh, that we um, as as Google would also comply with, and in order to meet those standards, we go through our own external audits uh, to ensure that. Uh, we have developed our own practices and processes in compliance with uh, certain standards and certificates that we would certify to, to provide assurance to our customers like yourself that we've met certain criteria and, and standard for privacy and security uh, for our AIML product offerings as well. Sounds great. Well, Shuba, thank you so much for this. And thanks to all of our attendees for all the great questions and being so engaged and everything. Uh, just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day um, Tuesday, Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thank you all. Thanks, Shuba. Thank you. Hope you all have a great day.